Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Are we still in Lebanon or <laughs> we have switched now to Malawi? Maybe we need to switch, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I was very happy to be here. Uh, yesterday, I think I came early in the morning. And also to find some people who have spent a bit of their time in Malawi. Uh, that's very good. I have my brother there all the way from Haiti. He came to establish partners in health. Abwenzi, Mzao Moyo. Yeah, he was in the quite remote area of Malawi and he knows how hard to reach that place is. A whole district. Very hilly, no passable roads sometimes. Very difficult, but he survived. And he, here we are, he has even flown to France. Yeah, so that's that's very good. And also, I think we had Willis as well, who, was also, who also spent much of his time in Malawi years back. So that's very good. And several others also we have interacted. They're even mentioning Malawi names. So uh, you know Malawi very well. That's what I'm trying to imply, that at least whatever I'm presenting, you really have a background, some of you, and you should be able to understand some of our issues as, as we present them. Indeed, Malawi um, had suffered a big setback. Let me see if this thing is going to... So moving the slides is this one. Lighting. Oh, this is pointing. Okay. And the other one is going back, right? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, Malawi's history about cholera, I think, is quite long-standing, since 1973. There have been subsequent, you know, um, outbreaks. You can see the, the years. But from 1998, I think we've been suffering cholera almost every year. The difference is just the varying degrees and how much it's, it impacted in the entire health system. Until the most recent, uh, which we just had. Uh, basically, this is a slide that is just summarizing the entire history uh, of our outbreak, the most recent. Uh, you can see... I hope I'm pointing well there. Yeah, this is 2022, February 28. Yeah, that's when we started suffering um, this cholera. We had a case confirmed and things began. Of course, for quite some time where we could have held it by its horns, maybe up to somewhere in June, things could have been controlled. But for some reason, not much was still done to control uh, the cases. However, we went all the way staggered up to somewhere here um, in uh, August. Things started going up, tried a bit of control, escalated all the way. And you can see our worst, worst season or period, yeah, which kept on going up all the way. So the peak was somewhere around... Uh, 2023, and almost in February, which was like one year later, things just went uncontrollably very high. Things were happening, interventions were happening, but a lot more things happened. And you can remember things that also worsened the whole situation, including the cyclone frayed, yeah, the heavy rains in some parts of the, of the country. They all disturbed um, our approaches to dealing with this particular um, outbreak. Um, maybe just also to mention that you can see our case fatality was, was kept high, yeah? Uh, here, our case fatality was kept high when it's supposed to be as less than 1%. Yeah, see the number of deaths and even the cases, closer to 60,000. That's quite a lot and quite huge numbers. And considering our hospital capacities and how these also uh, cases were quite concentrated in some areas, made it very difficult for health systems to run. And for your information, people were even coming, the one carrying the, uh, the, the patient would come by a motorbike. It meant that the patient was actually riding at the back, very weak. They're just pooping anyhow. The transmission was quite, was quite high. The transmission was quite high. And you can already begin to think what was happening in the community. And the, um, the most recent, the red, the, red, um, the red bit here is just telling us that we are continuing to receive some of the cases in the lower 
states of uh, Malawi. This is in Sanja and Chikwawa. They are neighboring districts, but also at the very tip, um, neighboring with our colleagues in Mozambique. So even Mozambique, districts around these border areas, they are also struggling with cholera, which I think my, present, my, 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 my friend Ebly uh, presented. But otherwise, we've been able to control the disease. These are the number of days uh, some districts have been without cases. You can see all the way up 207, all the way down uh, to some just about 18, 18 days or a month ago when they have st stopped uh, reporting cases. So somewhere, somehow, we are not yet out of the woods. We still need to, uh, to do something about it. And you may also know that, uh, recall that uh, even the vaccine doses which are provided, is just a single dose. So the whole one year has already elapsed. So the risk goes back. See, the risk goes back. So this is just a map um, of the same, indicating where these districts are. So this is in Sanje, and Chikwawa is just here. And all this part is in the mouth of Mozambique, all this part. So we are either pushing cases to Mozambique, or Mozambique is pushing cases to us. That's what is happening. So when we are intervening, massive cross-border collaboration uh, becomes uh, paramount. Um, this was just trying to tell us about a week, 17, uh, 17th of September. I think I've uh, made most of the comments around this, but the most important thing is to note is uh, we have not had uh, deaths, even up to seven weeks. So to us, that's a plus. We are on the way to uh, managing the complications of this outbreak. While we may be in the outbreak, but managing mortality, I think, is also uh, critical. Some of the interventions uh, which had been done included, um, we made sure that surveillance was massively strengthened, the IDSR, uh, some cross-border cross -border monitoring also, plus lab investigations. At least we're able to do even some catches right at, the, at some of the facilities, which initially was, not, uh, was a tall order even for the country. So we are able to do even lab catchers, apart from the uh, rapid diagnostic testing that is happening. Uh, and of course, the, the case definition, which is a bit more sensitive as well. Um, water and sanitation issues, still a challenge. By the time we had the outbreak, we were just dealing with the, about 40 to 50% of coverage of our um, sanitation, especially latrines. You know, and then having the heavy rains that came and the cyclones, obviously a massive devastation we almost collapsed and went down uh, very low. We're not sure the numbers, but we knew that also had a significant uh, impact. Uh, water sources was also a challenge. So we believe enhancement of water and sanitation activities uh, was quite key to dealing with the, um, our outbreak. And again, healthy promotion uh, became paramount because it was very important to convince the people to uptake, to, to have some good uptake over our interventions, and among other things include the chlorine. You know, piped water which we have, chlorination is not a question, it's always there, it's already taken care of. But think about the masses, over 70% of our masses that are actually using uh, unprotected wells and you know, poor sources of water. So when you're bringing in chlorine, uh, chlorine its strength it becomes a problem. I'm used to taking chlorine because I take water from the tap and then I'm used. Sometimes I don't even get the smell. But for them to actually pick a cup or to pick a, a something to drop chlorine, I mean, the smell is just with them. They can't take it. So there's really, there was really need for massive, you know, um, health promotion activities to deal with this. But also use of um, toilets or pit latrines, protected sources. Even authentication is still an issue that we are trying to deal with in our country. However, we are very lucky that the president committed his time and we had what we call Titetse Cholera campaign. And Titetse in our language means end, end cholera um, campaign. So the president had to come in and launch. It took a bit longer, but he came in and he supported that and it made a huge uh, difference. And then, of course, uh, immunization. Uh, using OCV vaccine. It took us a bit longer for, for, for the authorization to happen, the approvals, but finally we got it and we had several doses that came into the country uh, in, the, in, the, in the period of the, of the, of the game. 
outbreak, and that was very powerful. I remember at some point, 2.9 million, uh, I mean 1.9 million, you moved to almost uh, 3 million doses. Several doses had come to our country, and thanks for the consideration uh, doing that. We know it's not easy. We have already seen how challenging it is to get more doses, even for other countries. We are even fearing to apply for preventive uh, OCV uh, doses, because we feel we may take too much of what our friends also need uh, mostly. But we are still in the corridor zone. Maybe we need to think about it. And I just thought I should also uh, put this slide. Uh, I'm so biased about vaccines. So we had some reactive campaigns, as I mentioned. Our coverages were able to still meet 70%, of course, with some challenges here and there. Massive hesitancy that came with the uh, COVID. And of course, we also had polio in, in the country. So we are also pushing more and more doses to the people. Measles, which we are also trying to protect our people. So we pushed a lot of doses as well to the people. So a lot has been happening, uh, making the people uh, not to be hesitant about even immunizations. But at least we managed 70% in the first round in May 2022. We also managed 97.6%, which is around 98% or so in the other round, uh, somewhere November 2022. And then we had another one uh, just recently or so where we were able to hit about 75% which is, I think, uh, a plus. And then, of course, uh, the last one we just did for two districts, Nsanje and Chikwawa, which are still presenting cases. Otherwise, uh, this was the most important bit that helped us quite a lot. I don't know whether I should really be detailed about this, but I thought I can just present this um, extract from um, what was already provided for uh, in the uh, uh, cholera application. So we were able to sit together, do a case management, um, detailed discussion, and we're able to come up with these uh, flowcharts that provide guidance in all the uh, districts, facilities, so that when a cholera case comes, they are able to know exactly what is supposed to be done. So I should just mention that this is a massive extract from the application, and we tried to contextualize it. Uh, within our setting. So as I mentioned, do you want me to take you through? <laughs> Otherwise, it's, it's a whole presentation if I am to go by, by it. But the colors and everything, they make meaning uh, to themselves, what needs to be done. Red, you're in danger zone. Yellow, somehow you need to make sure you work quickly. You can either push yourself towards red or you push yourself towards green. And what we want is to get ourselves to green. But when you move to green, at least things are getting better. And this made a huge difference. And for your information, we had some people that were employed on the ground by um, our partners supporting the Minister of Health dealing with COVID. Uh, at that time, uh, over 2,000 or so uh, health workers were actually employed nurses meant to support with vaccinations uh, for COVID. So we had to uh, repurpose them to support uh, with cholera interventions. So over 2,000 nurses and clinicians were repurposed. And we had to provide immediate training on case management so that they can deal with this. And they were the ones that helped to run our CTUs. And another important uh, thing to note is the, you can't see this one properly, but we also had an admission and a triage form, which was also uh, developed uh, to help us. Yeah, I think I'll share this presentation, and then you can see uh, some of these things. But these things became very, very critical and paramount in whatever we had to do so that we can put this um, outbreak to a stop. And for your information, um, some of our colleagues from WHO and one colleague also who was at then working at accidents and emergency uh, in one of our central hospitals, he went to visit one of the sites out of his own curiosity and interest. He noted there was massive failure of who, how we were managing the cases. So he came in, made his own interventions, and is the one who also helped uh, push us around to get all this done. And they also went ahead to develop what they call emergency management team, and they put themselves together as emergency man management team, trying to deal with cases one by one and supporting districts that are reporting more cases. And uh, beyond that is also uh, they went ahead to do what we call um, uh, uh, ZCITs. They are more or less like uh, intervention or directed activities. So they will deal with the case, but they also move forward to see where is this case coming from? 
then they go and do a social survey there, understand the issues, and address it right there. That also helped uh, quite a lot. Um, this is uh, more or less a continuation of the same. I just thought I can put this picture around here where somebody is also just educating the people um, on daily basis. Otherwise, some of the achievements, having those um, two important items which I've presented was massive reduction in mortality rates. Uh, we're dealing with now almost zero for seven weeks. That's a plus. Health workers are trained and equipped for case management, and I think we just need to continue with that. Uh, but also case management resource mobilization became streamlined. Because sometimes when you don't know what to do and things are just scattered, it becomes very difficult for you to know exactly what you need to have. You can have one thing and you may not have the other, and this does not help. And I'm happy this is already the discussion which we are having here. Yesterday we were discussing a kit, and somehow we are also discussing what is it that needs to be put there, and where else uh, do we need to uh, manage our cases. But I thought I can spend just two or three minutes. I know my time is almost getting... But I thought I can talk about the community case management, which is oral rehydration points. Very important. So um, one of the critical aims was the, the oral rehydration points were implemented as a key strategy to curb high case uh, fatality rate during the 2022-2023 uh, cholera outbreak or season. And this was done indeed, and it made huge differences. Okay. The case definitions are there. Uh, the definition of quality that the ORP is occurrence of two or more uh, loose stools in 24 hours. So we assumed this is going to help whoever we're going to input there. And most of them were just volunteers. So they needed to know uh, this uh, critical. And all patients at ORP sites are deemed quality suspects as volunteers cannot diagnose quality patients. So we needed to make this thing uh, outright. And then there was a referral pathway all the way. Okay. Uh, all mild cases were managed at ORPs. So the community engagement in this sense was also lobbied. While they were dealing with the cases, they lobbied our community, the community engagement. And ORPs indeed are manned by our community volunteers and of course directly supervised by health surveillance assistants. And in fact, health surveillance assistants are not clinical people. These are our community health workers with the minimal training in health, but they are there and they were helping with all this. And then we had the ORP uh, kit which I think you can be detailed when you see the presentation. So there was a pilot that took place, but as of now, there are over 270 ORPs uh, that were implemented in 270 hotspots across 17 districts. Yeah, I saw that picture where you are putting point, ORIS points and you know, the network uh, of management. And then we had all these partners that came in to support. So it's an idea that people are interested Organizations are interested, but it's the way how we want to um, put the guidelines together and see how it can guide the whole process. Or if it's there, then maybe we need to, um, to share. And of course, this was the method. Um, coordination was done. Of course, the National ORP Technical Working Group was there. We had an integrated work plan. All partners contributed. The methodology was the method of implementation during the pilot, that is, was to integrate the RCC, wash case management, and IDSR components. So all these things were actually there right at the community as we provide the ORPs to make sure that we are dealing with this uh, case. And policy, of course, the ORP national guidelines were drafted in February 2023, and we are used to coordinate the effective rollout of the ORPs. And SOPs, yeah, and training materials were drafted as well. Ethics, data management, done. Otherwise, uh, let me not take much of your time here, but critical to note is what I've explained, that these were actually community-led um, and uh, done. Some of the challenges, I think, very important. ORP kits, the kit is expensive, and the exercise was donor-driven. So countries, they need to own. My country need to own this as government. Very important. Incentives. Partial incentives, others paid, others not paid. Maybe others were just given a T-shirt as a motivation or a, a, a shirt or a cloth as a motivation, but maybe we can do more around it. And then, of course, issues of uh, data management becomes very critical because we need to know who and who. Otherwise, uh, some of these cases that came can escape us and think maybe the burden of the disease was not as huge when, in essence, it was really, really huge. Otherwise, these are some of our recommendations uh, that we may need uh, to do. Um, still need for mentorship, preparedness survey, very important. We need to see if we can utilize digital platforms for information management. 
and then of course integration of RPs in the health services at primary level. That's c continuity uh, of everything else, yeah. And of course, to identify regular funding for ORP program. I think this has the potential to help and deal with the, uh, our planning for um, even the upcoming corona season. I think it's very important that we consider these things. And lastly, these are some of our challenges across, and then of course, uh, the way forward. Maybe I will just leave it for some seconds for you to, uh, to read. Thank you.